Welcome to New Heights, everyone, and uh, welcome to Homecoming Weekend, everyone. And I'm talking to everyone here at Central Vancouver Auditorium, and then everyone joining us at one of our campuses at New Heights West Vancouver, at East Vancouver, at Battleground. Um, we hope that you guys are having a wonderful homecoming weekend, no matter what campus you're at. <laughs> During homecoming weekend, you've already heard that um, our, our focus is on connecting with new friends, reconnecting with old friends, and connecting with our God in heaven that brought us all together as a church. It, to me, that seems like an appropriate focus for homecoming weekend, because that's what New Heights has been about for years. I mean, truly, ever since New Heights began as a church back in 1954, We've been all about celebrating our connection with Jesus and celebrating our connection with one another. And so here on Homecoming Weekend, that's what we're about. That's what we're going to do. And it seems appropriate also that then we would be kicking off a teaching series called Forming Friendships in a Lonely World. Um, so because friendships are of the utmost importance, importance to lots of us. They're vital to us. And just think about when, when you moved to Clark County, when you moved into the area, or, or maybe you moved somewhere within from one side of town to the next side of town. When you made that move, a priority for you, no doubt, was, okay, when we move there, are we going to make friends? And where are we going to find those friends? And it's a priority to us, right? Or think about, okay, parents in the room, if you have kids that went back to school this past week, or you're waiting for your kids to go back to school this next week, depending on where you're at, First day of school, when kids come home from school, what do you ask them? How was your day? Did you make any friends? Who'd you sit by? Did you, did you sit in, in class with your old friends? Did you make new friends? Who? We want, as parents, we want to know, kids, who are your friends? Because we know how vital friendships are. Or adults, doesn't just happen at school, it happens at work too, doesn't it? When you're at your job or you're, you're looking to start a new job, you're looking around saying, am I going to fit here? That is, am I going to have relationships, healthy, authentic relationships with people I work with? Or we do that even here at New Heights. No matter what campus you're at, when you pull onto the, onto the property, when you drive into the parking lot, you hope and pray, Lord, can you provide me with a connection with somebody so I can build a healthy, authentic friendship? You see... We all long for healthy, authentic relationships in every area of life, don't we? But here's the problem. The problem is you and I can be surrounded by people, yet still feel alone and isolated. That is, you can have the friendliest neighbors on the planet, yet still feel like a complete stranger to them. It's students, you could, you could go to school with the same group of students and sit next to them every day, five days a week, for every week out of the year, and you could do that for 12 years until you graduate high school and still feel like you don't know them and they don't know you. And I wish I could say that it ends at school, but again, adults, you know this, that can even happen in the workplace, can't it? You could show up to your office tomorrow morning and you could have just chatty colleagues and coworkers around you and yet you still feel like you're not on the, in, the inside. You're not on the in crowd at, in the office. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm saddened to admit this and embarrassed to admit this, but that can also happen here at any one of our New Heights campuses. That is, you could be greeted in the parking lot. You could be greeted in the lobby. You could be greeted in the auditorium. But at the end of the service, when you get in your car and you drive home, you still feel overlooked or alone or isolated. You see, just because we're around people, just because we're, we're near people, doesn't mean that we're, we automatically have healthy, authentic relationships with people around us. In fact, quite the opposite. We can feel like we're alone and isolated. And every one of us has felt that way at some point in our life. Every one of us has felt alone. And if you felt all alone, here's what I want you to know. If you felt all alone, you are not alone. <laughs> Because we've all felt alone at some point, and many of us feel alone right now. In fact, in our country, this is, a, this is an epidemic, this idea of loneliness. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General just released a report this past year that said, our nation's next epidemic, it is not a virus, but it's loneliness and isolation. And this 80-page report was, recent, was recently released. And in this report, um, we hear that loneliness is at an all-time high in the lives of people who live in our country. In fact, um, adults, 50% uh, of all U.S. adults are experiencing loneliness at a record-breaking number right now. 
Um, and not just, I mean, think all adults, I mean, 50% of adults, but then if you hone in on young adults, that is around that 19, 20, 21 year of age, um, it's even greater there. Look at this. Um, from 1976 to 2019, the rate of loneliness among young adults has increased every single year. However lonely young adults feel today, next year, they're going to feel even lonelier. The year after that, even lonelier. And young adults especially, but the truth is, adults of all ages, anytime we start to feel a little bit lonely, what do we do? We try to distract ourselves, right? So an, an easy way to do that, take your phone out and start scrolling on your phone because, oh, my phone is my friend. Or maybe even worse, social media is my friend. And this report also identifies how social media impacts our, our level of loneliness. That is, social media usage. There's some people who who scroll through social media two hours or more per day. There's others that scroll through social media 30 minutes or less every day. And this report tells us that those who are on social media two hours or more every day, they actually end up feeling twice as lonely as those who only spend 30 minutes or less. That means that the very source that we are using to try to solve our loneliness, social media, is actually causing us greater loneliness and isolation. So the question is, why? Why is that? Because you and I were created for healthy, authentic relationships with one another. And yet, you and I have a hard time starting, growing, and maintaining healthy, authentic relationships. But we live in this world where we are more connected than ever before, yet we've never felt more disconnected than ever before. Have you experienced this? that we're more connected than ever before. That is, we have more people in our lives and access to more people in our lives than anyone in the history of time. And yet, you and I, we feel more disconnected than ever before because we recognize that we live in this lonely world, which is why we're doing this series. We're kicking this off this week. Forming friendships in a lonely world. We recognize we live in a lonely world and we were designed for healthy, authentic relationships. This is not a new problem, this idea of living in a lonely world. This is not a 21st century problem, but this is a timeless problem. In fact, there's a passage of scripture that was written almost 3,000 years ago that addresses how to live in a lonely world. 3,000 years ago. So this is a timeless problem. It was written by a man named King Solomon. And King Solomon was one of the wisest men to ever live and one of the wealthiest men to ever live. Uh, there's a passage, a little verse in 2 Chronicles that tells us, that summarizes his life. Um, it says that King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth sought an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. You see, <laughs> Solomon, as the wealthiest and wisest man to ever live, he kind of experienced everything you could experience. He did everything you could do. He owned everything you could possibly own. And because of his wisdom, he knew everything that you could kind of know at, at the time. And I mean, he's, okay, you know what he reminds me of? You guys know that commercial for the farmer's insurance? You know the little slogan? Their slogan is, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. You know that one? King Solomon, the original farmer's insurance guy. He knows a thing or two because he's seen a thing or two. We are farmers, bum, 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 bum. you know the one. Okay, now you're gonna have that stuck in your head for the rest of the day, sorry about that. King Solomon, one of the wisest men to ever live, one of the wealthiest men to ever live, said, let me, t let me capture a summary of what I have learned. And that summary, he, he, he captures all of that in the book of Ecclesiastes. Actually, the book of Ecclesiastes is kind of the summary of, uh, of a, the greatest social experiment ever conducted. Because King Solomon, towards the end of his life, he said, what would life look like if I removed God out of the equation? What would wealth look like if I pulled God out of wealth or, or pulled God out of my work or pulled God out of government? What would that look like? And all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, he uses this phrase, life under the sun. And what that means is life without God. So all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, he gives us these little snapshots of what these areas of life would look like life under the sun, that is, without God's influence in that area. So the passage we're looking at today <clears throat> comes to us in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Solomon highlights, here's what relationships would look like without God's influence in them. And can I tell you that I am excited that I get to share this particular passage of scripture with you today, 
because it highlights, it gives us a little snapshot of kind of the, the painful problem of living all alone, but it doesn't end there because it also offers us a bit of hope for how we can live differently. And it gives us the, the powerful promise and benefit of living a life that's fully known. So I'm glad I got to share this passage with you. I want to begin Ecclesiastes chapter four, starting in verse seven. This is what it says. It says, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Whew, aren't you glad you came to church this morning, huh? Okay, this, if it sounds a little sad and depressing, it's because it is a little sad and depressing. Because here in this first half of this passage, we're getting the snapshot of, of a life lived all alone. And so we see that here in verse 7. So let's look at these first two verses one more time. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There's that phrase again, under the sun. That means life without God. Here's what relationships look like without God. Verse 8, there was a man all alone. That's what life looks like without God. That's what relationships look like without God, all alone. That is, we recognize, we must recognize that relationships are a gift from God. And so the moment we take God out of our lives or say, God, I don't want you to influence any relationships in my life, then we lose relationships as well. We, we end up living all alone. And Solomon defines this, this type of life all alone. He describes it in a pretty negative way. He says he had neither son nor brother. No. He paused right here, because when you and I read this, and we say, okay, well, that sounds like bad news, but it's not the end of the world. Well, in Solomon's day, this was bad news, and it was the end of the world. Because in Solomon's day, you, you wanted to have a son, because it was your son who would come alongside you and learn the family business and would inherit everything you've worked your whole life to gain. And so you could hand that off to your son. You couldn't hand it off to a daughter or a woman. You could only hand it off to a man. So if you didn't have a son, well, then you really wanted to have a brother so that, again, you, your brother could come alongside you and work alongside you and you can hand off your whole inheritance to him. So if you had neither son nor brother, then you truly were all alone. Now, thankfully, for you and I living today, our loneliness is not just dependent on whether or not you have a son or a brother. But unfortunately, as we've already d discussed, you and I, we can, we can still be surrounded by people, yet still feel isolated and alone every bit as much as this individual, this guy in this story. And when that happens, we can become overwhelmed with the pain and the problem of being all alone. So here in this passage, the rest of verse 8, King Solomon kind of describes these four different snapshots, these four different problems of living a life all alone. And I want to look at these real briefly, because then, like I said, the passage gives us a little bit of hope on the second half, and I want to get to that. So um, verse 8, he says, here's, here's these four different problems with being all alone. The first is, there was no end to his toil. That is, this man, he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and there was no finish line. We have to stop and say, well, why would someone do that? Why would someone invest their whole life into work and neglect relationships? Here's why. Because it, it, sometimes it's easier to focus on something you can control like work. And relationships, those are messy, aren't they? And so you, if you don't have relationships in your life, then you're looking just to be distracted away and focus your attention somewhere else, and that's exactly what he does. That's the first problem with being all alone. It's that you're distracted, and in particular, you're distracted by work. And you and I, we live in a culture that actually celebrates this, don't we? That celebrates someone who's fully committed to work, overly committed to their work. And, and we fall into this trap because, again, just like in Solomon's day, relationships, people, relationships over here, these are messy. Relationships, they're hard to navigate. But when I'm at the office, when I'm going to work, I got sales figures that I can attack and go after. I've got key performance indicators that I can move towards. I got strategic initiatives that I know I, at work I can attack those. I've got measurable metrics, and I, at work I'm all in. Relationships, I can neglect those for right now, but I'm fully invested at work. And then we can start to convince ourselves and, and rationalize it and say, besides, if I'm investing all of my time and energy in my job, well, I mean, the harder I work, the more I get paid. So it's all good, right? Eh, wrong. 
Solomon knew we would say that, and so he addresses that in the second problem here. Look, look at verse 8 again. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. That is, for this individual who's living a life all alone, he was never satisfied. He's dissatisfied with his wealth. And that, that's the second problem of being all alone. You're dissatisfied with your wealth. And, and again, in our culture, we think, well, if I just had a little more, if I made a little more, if I saved a little more, well, then my life would be complete. And Solomon is reminding us here, again, Solomon, the wealthiest man to ever live, is reminding us wealth is not the answer. Because if you're gaining all of that wealth and you got nobody to share it with, well, then it's, it's all for naught. And he says, and he reminds us of that here in this, the third verse, the third phrase. Look at his third phrase. For whom am I toiling, he asked. That is, this man, when he was distracted by work, he's dissatisfied with his wealth, and he looks around and says, I'm completely disconnected with people. And that's the third problem. He's disconnected with people. He's been investing his life and paying attention to work and wealth that he's completely neglected relationships in his life. And the longer you are disconnected with people, the further away you'll drift. And before long, when you've drifted far enough away from people, you'll realize that the joy has been sucked out of your life. And that's his fourth and final conclusion. Look at verse 8. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? That is, this man looked around and realized, my life has no joy anymore. And if you have no joy, then you are discouraged with the direction of your life. And that's the fourth and final problem, is that he's discouraged with the direction of his life. So for you and I, when we hear this list and we read this passage, we see that the problem with being all alone makes us feel distracted, dissatisfied, disconnected, discouraged. We look at this list, and for any one of us that have experienced any one of these in our life, and, and we've all experienced one of these to some degree, we'd say, yes, our conclusion is that's a miserable way to live. You're exactly right. That's Solomon's conclusion as well. His very last sentence in verse 8 says, this too is meaningless, a miserable business. It's miserable when you feel like you're isolated and lonely and you don't have healthy, authentic connections with other people around you. And so we have to stop and say, well, what's another way to live? If, if I'm feeling isolated and alone, what's the opposite of feeling all alone? Well, the opposite of being all alone, it's not just being in a crowded room. Because as we've said, we can feel isolated and alone even if we're in a crowded room. The opposite of being isolated and all alone is not just being near people. The opposite of being all alone is being fully known. That's the opposite of being all alone. To be fully known, to have someone in your life who knows who you are and, and can walk along life with you and for you to know them. So the question is, so what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, just like Solomon paints a picture of four negative examples, you know, for the four problems with being all alone, now he gives us a snapshot of four positive examples. That is, four benefits, the power of being fully known. And we see that here in, in these next couple of verses. So first look at verse 9. It says, two are better than one. Two are better than one. That is, the first few verses gave us a snapshot of just the isolation of being by yourself, being alone. And he says, but there's a better way to live. Find someone who can really know you. Two are better than one. And here's, here's one of the benefits. Because they have good return for their labor. They have good return for their labor. See that phrase? That means when two people work together, and they're working towards the same goal, and they're both known by one another. Well, then they, they can um, multiply their potential. And that's the first, um, first fill in the blank for the power of being fully known. The greatest benefit for being fully known is that you can multiply potential. That is, when you work side by side, you can accomplish more together. I've seen this in my own life with um, actually working with my dad. Um, in our household, um, my family and I, we've lived in our house for, uh, I don't know, a couple years. And even in these few years that we've lived in our house, anytime there's a house project that needs to be tackled, you know who I call? I call dad. 
And I say, Dad, I need some help. So together, over the past few years, he and I have worked together to build a shed in the backyard. He and I have worked together to build a workbench in the garage. He and I have worked together to put in a sprinkler system throughout our whole property. He and I have worked together to put in a backyard. He and I worked together to put in a front yard. He and I worked together to put in a huge paver patio um, in the backyard. And no, you cannot hire him because I'm using all of his time for my house projects, okay? And by the way, uh, Dad, I think you're watching at New Heights West Vancouver right now this morning. Just mark your calendar. I have a bathroom remodel project that's coming your way this next year, okay? And here's what I've discovered, working side by side with my dad. Um, when we work together, we're getting more done. We're accomplishing more together. And because he knows me so well and I know him so well, it's actually enjoyable work. And so Solomon is reminding us that when you are fully known by someone else and you're working side by side, not only is there great, great return for your labor, but also the work is enjoyable. And he says that's the first benefit, the power of being fully known. Here's the second one. Um, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. This idea of falling down, it's a reminder that every one of us, we are, we're bound to have a crisis in our lives. Either we've just come out of a crisis, we're in the midst of a crisis, or we're on our way to a crisis. And when those problems pop up in our lives, the question is, who's going to help us navigate that space? Who's going to help us navigate those problems? And that's the second um, benefit of being fully known, is that you have someone in your life who can help you manage problems, who can help you manage problems. And you see, we have to recognize that every one of us, you're going to stumble and fall. And so who's there to help pick you up and offer support in that moment of crisis? Here at New Heights, we have a number of support groups, a number of support groups that do exactly that. Alcoholics Victorious, that helps those that struggle with drug and alcohol addiction. Financial Peace University, for when people need just a little bit of coaching in finances. Grief support, if you've lost a loved one. For men only, for those who struggle with sexual addiction. Single parents. Listen, friends, parenting is one of the hardest jobs in the world. And parenting alone has got to be nearly impossible. So we have a support group for single parents who can help one another and support one another. And also marriage mentoring. That is a marriage that, has, that hits a rocky place. We have coaching for you. Or individuals who are entering into marriage, like pre-marriage counseling and coaching. We have marriage mentoring for you as well. And the whole goal of all of these support groups is first and foremost to invite people to surrender to Jesus. And when they surrender to Jesus, then they also discover that there are people who are a little further along the path than they are who can come alongside them and offer them a hand in a time of need. That's what these support groups are all about, to help one another in that moment of crisis. That's what Solomon's talking about here in this verse. Now, let me, look at the, let me show you the third item that he, that he says. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? You see, in Solomon's day, if you're going to bed at nighttime and it's, the house is too cold, you don't go run down to the thermostat and click it up a few degrees. And then your spouse runs to that same thermostat and clicks it down a few degrees and you do the thermostat war thing. No, instead, in Solomon's day, if you're cold at nighttime, you're about to go to bed, you just got to... Grab someone, pull them close to you, and sleep close to, together. That is a, a picture of just meeting practical needs. And that's the third, third benefit, meeting practical needs. You see, in my family, uh, I take my two sons on a trip every single year. Um, camping sometimes. We go, we've seen a lot of college football games. Um, take them to the coast. We go out of town. We call it the Edmonds Man Venture. So this past weekend, on Labor Day weekend, took them camping in Central Oregon. Central Oregon, high desert, which means it's really hot during the day and freezing cold during the night. And um, you should have seen us, because when we were setting up the tent, um, we all want our space, right? I need my space, don't get too close. And so one sleeping bag and suitcases over here, another sleeping bag and suitcases over here, another one's over on the far side of the tent. And that's the way it begins. And then we all, we all at nighttime, go to bed, crawl in the sleeping bag, and then night falls and the temperature drops. And when we wake up in the morning, we discover all three of us are bunched together. And the next night, we're fighting over who gets to sleep in the middle. <laughs> so if you've ever been camping or hunting or anything like that, then you know that you're looking for some body warmth in that moment. You're just meeting practical needs in that moment. And you, you get this, because even if you're not a camper or a hunter, then you see this lived out in, in lots of other ways. You have a friend or family member that is in the hospital, and they get out of the hospital, they come home, what do you do? 
you drop by and you deliver a meal, meeting practical needs. You know a couple or a young family that's, that's going through a, a challenge, um, what do you do? You volunteer to watch their kids so the couple can, can go spend some time together. You have a friend or family member or neighbor that's moving? Oh, we went there. Help a friend move? Are you serious? Yes, that's a practical need, huh? A friend of mine in my life, Matt Nissen. Many of you guys know him. He's a worship leader at New Heights Battleground. Matt Nissen, to me, I, I always give him a hard time because he's the kind of friend that will help any one of his friends move. And I, I, I swear, he's helped 100 different people move. And I've always told him, look, Matt, if you ever get to the point where you move from one side of the town to the next, you can cash in those chips and you can invite, you, you got a lot of people who are going to come help you move. Matt is a guy who's living out this, this passage on a regular basis. And can you invite Matt? Can you ask Matt to help you move? Maybe. Okay, or maybe not, because that's a lot of people knocking on his door to help, to help him move. Because the truth is, we help people who, who know us really well, don't we? And that when we're, it's time for us to move, we ask our close, close friends and family, can you help me? Because it's when we're fully known that we want to meet the practical needs of those around us. Now, let me show you the, the fourth and final one here. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. So the fourth and final powerful benefit here of being fully known is to maximize protection, to maximize protection. Now, you and I living in today's world, <clears throat> we could say, well, hold on a second. Why would I need to be protected? What sort of a benefit is that? Why do I need to be defended? Because maybe in Solomon's day, when they're at war, that makes sense. But in our day, when would this ever make sense? Well, let me ask you this. <clears throat> Do you know any young adults that are starting their career and entering into the workforce? Let me tell you, those young adults, they need a, a professional mentor who can coach them through the start of their career and help them navigate the workplace. Can you offer them? Can you defend them and protect them? You bet you could. Or think about this. Do you know any parents of toddlers? Those young parents need a little more seasoned parents to come alongside them and to remind them that you're not in the toddler years forever. There's light at the end of the parenting tunnel. And don't tell them about the teenage years yet. Just, <laughs> just tell them you can get through the toddler years. You'll make it through. Or if you're retired and you've been retired for a number of years, you have no doubt, you, have, you know friends and, and, and family who are nearing retirement or they're considering retirement. Those who are about to enter retirement need a friend to come alongside and offer a little coaching and talk to them about the ups and downs of retirement. You see, we all in our lives hit a certain point where we need someone to come alongside us and help protect us and defend us and offer a little coaching and a little help. And we read about these four benefits of being fully known. Every one of us would say, yeah, that's the kind of friend that I want in my life. But the question is, are we that type of friend in someone else's life? You see, no doubt, every one of us would want that type of friendship to be fully known in that kind of a way. But when it comes time to being that type of a friend in someone else's life, then a lot of us would say, oh, you know, that requires a lot of extra time. I don't have time. That requires a lot of extra energy. I don't have the energy. That requires a little vulnerability. I don't really want to be that vulnerable. And we can start to say, I don't have what it takes to be that type of friend in someone else's life. Exactly. None of us have what it takes to be that type of a friend in someone else's life. And Solomon highlights that here in the very last line of this, of this passage. Remember, he says, the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but look at this, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. All right, hold on there, Solomon, because you said two are better than one. Who's this third person in the mix here? He's saying, it's God. Inviting God into your life and into your relationships is where you can draw strength to be that type of friend in someone else's life. You see, for every one of us, our ultimate goal here is not just to have more friends. Our ultimate goal in life should not be just to have healthy, authentic relationships with people, but truly the most fulfilling relationship we could possibly have in this world is a relationship with our Father in heaven. 
That's why God came to this earth to be with us as Jesus Christ so that, he could, so that we could have a relationship with him. And so first and foremost, we are called to surrender to Jesus and to enter into a relationship with him. And the moment we do that, we discover that's, a, that's the third cord that's woven around our lives and in our relationships with people. It's finding our strength first in Jesus and then recognizing now I have something to offer in a relationship that God brings my way. That's why you and I are called to be that type of a friend in someone else's life. You see, we know the, the pain, we know the problem of living all alone, and we see this snapshot of the powerful benefits of being fully known, and, and for lots of us here, I, I'm guessing there's, there's two groups of people here. The first group is saying, okay, Matt, I get it, but I, have, I know so many people in my life that I don't know where to start. I know people at my office. I know people in my neighborhood. I know people here at this church. I have people in my family. I have people, just friends. So, so how can I have a healthy, authentic relationship with all of them? And the answer is, you don't have to have a healthy, authentic relationship with all of them because Solomon, remember what Solomon is saying? Solomon doesn't say 200 are better than one. Solomon doesn't say two dozen are better than one. Solomon says two are better than one. Two, which means you plus who equals two. How's that? You plus who equals two. So the only question we should be asking ourselves is, who's our who? Who's your who? Now, I know grammatically this doesn't make sense, and it kind of sounds like a Dr. Seuss book, but, but it just we should all pause for a moment and say, who's the one person that the Lord has strategically placed in my life who I can take the next step towards and first, having faith in Jesus, I have something of significance to offer this individual, and I can be that type of a friend in their life. And all you have to do is just pick one person. At the start of all of our services here during homecoming weekend, um, we all had these footballs that we were handed. We were all asked to write our name on these footballs, and then we all chucked these footballs across our auditoriums. Now, if you showed up late to our service and you're like, you did what? It's okay, stick around for the next service and, and experience that. We, we chucked these footballs across the auditoriums at all of our campuses. On your way out today, at all of our campuses, all of our services, we're gonna have volunteers holding baskets with these same footballs in them. And when you leave, when you exit the auditorium, I invite you to grab one of those footballs and take that home with you. Because we want this football with someone else's name on it to serve as a reminder to you that it's just you plus who equals two. Use this football as a reminder that it's just one person that the Lord has strategically placed in your life who you're called to demonstrate this type of friendship with. You know, when you get this football and it's got someone's name on it, that doesn't mean you have to track them down. <laughs> that might be a little creepy, okay? But you could be praying for that individual for sure, because no doubt that person is at some point in their life, maybe right now, feels lonely and isolated. And maybe that person right now is looking for healthy, authentic friendships. So pray for that individual. But use this football as a reminder. Put it in your cup holder in your car so when you're driving to New Heights next weekend, you'll look at this and remember, Lord, who's the one person that you want me to connect with? Or put it on your desk at work. And so when your colleagues walk by, you can look at this football and be reminded, Lord, who's the one person that you want me to connect with here at work? Or put on the windowsill of your house. So when you look out your window and you look at your neighbor's houses, you say, Lord, who's the one neighbor you want me to invest in right now? Use this football as your, as your reminder that two are better than one. So who's the one person that the Lord's placed in your life that he's calling you to invest in? So use this as a reminder, especially if you're looking at your life, you say, I got a lot of people in my life who I could choose. I don't know where to start. But I recognize there's other folks here who, who are saying, in my life, I don't have anyone to choose. That is, wouldn't that be a great problem if I had hundreds of people in my life, but right now maybe you feel like you have zero people in your life and you don't know where to start. Well, if that's you, then I would direct your attention to this little printed program you were handed when you came in. And inside the printed program, you can see that we're kicking off community groups and you can sign up for a community group. There's a little QR code or a little website you can visit. This is the last day to sign up for community groups, and they kick off here in a couple weeks. And our desire with community groups is that in these community groups, we get to know one another and have connection and friendship with one another. But that connection and friendship is rooted in our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
that as God uses these relationships in these community groups to draw us closer to one another and closer to him. So maybe still others of you are saying, you know, what I really feel like I need right now in my life is one of those support groups. If that's you, check one of those boxes on the back of the connection card. And when I'm finished praying, I'm going to ask our volunteers to come forward and pass buckets as we sing another worship song. And we'll collect those connection cards and give you a chance to, to sign up for one of those support groups or scan that code for a community group or carry that football with you as your reminder that God's got someone in your life that he wants you to be that type of a friend with, okay? Please join me. We'll pray together. Father in heaven, we recognize that we cannot do this on our own. We recognize that we were created to be in relationships with one another. We were created for healthy, authentic relationships. And yet we can't just carry the weight of that on our own. We must first find a relationship with you. We must first surrender our lives to you, Lord Jesus, and to watch you working in us so that you can begin working through us to impact the people around us. So Lord Jesus, would you please help us to surrender our lives to you first and foremost? And then, Lord, would you please help us to identify the one person that you've strategically placed in our life who we can be that type of a friend to that you've placed in our life. Lord, please guide all of our relationships. And for those here today that are feeling particularly lonely and isolated, Lord, would you please wrap your arms around them, show them how much you love them, show them that you are near to them, you desire to have a relationship with them, and you have a whole set of friendships in store for them. Lord, we surrender our lives to you. We surrender our relationships to you. We look forward to seeing how you will continue to draw us closer to you in the days ahead. We pray these things in the power of your name. Amen.